Like right. I am going to live my life and do everything that I can to survive on this planet, you know, doing remarkable things. I, I came up with this, this idea yeah. of life is just a bunch of experiences you have until you die. That's it. It's very simple. My goal is to try to make those experiences as amazing as I possibly can. That's it. It's that simple. Yeah. It's a very simple philosophy, concept, idea, and it's how I do the things that I do. It's incredible. You know, Jeb, I was hearing you talk about this part right here, and I was reading your book. It's, you guys, it's, you know, we were talking earlier. My three boys are ski racers out here in yeah. Colorado. I'm a big skier, and for the past, ever since they were alive and before they were alive, Every fall, I watch every ski, big mountain ski movie that's pushed out. So obviously, when I got to the Shane McConkey chapter, uh, yeah. I about shit my pants because he was a legend, pretty yeah, much invented fat skis, yeah. you know. Yeah, and then obviously got into the base thing, and we, we know how that ended up. But yeah. could you tell a little bit of that story? Just I live in a ski town, and that one was that you how meeting I, him and Sean, Shane, <laughs> yeah, doing a, a pre jump for him. <laughs> to it, test the cameras you know it, it's funny because um at the time i met him i had no idea who shane mcconkey was like, right I didn't, I didn't know i i found out later like what a legend he was um yeah. but i had just gotten i was on a trip and i had just gotten back from angel falls where some crazy stuff oh. happened and i i i was in chamonix and this was towards the end of the trip and there was the the jump that actually inspired me to become a base jumper was maglon in chamonix france Oh, okay. And that was the first jump I saw. And, and I, it was so it was a, a kind of a big deal for me to go jump Maglon. Like, I'm like, I need to go do a jump. And not just a jump, I need to do a gainer because that's what I saw. I saw a guy do a gainer. Right. I'm like, I'm going to do a gainer off this thing. I'm going to do the jump that inspired me to do this. Right. And well, that's um, pretty cool. That was, that, you know, I, I was excited about it, you know. Yeah, you're recreating and, what, what inspired you the yeah, first time. I How wanted cool. to do what, I, what made me yeah. want to do it. So um, it just so happened, though, it was in the middle of winter. February, like, you know, for Angel Falls, it's perfect time of year to go there because that's when their dry season is and that's yeah, when you can warm. jump. But it's really cold in Europe and it's like that's their time for if you're a skier and you want to be in thick snow. Um, but I had tennis shoes, normal socks, <laughs> a pair of jeans, a couple t-shirts. I didn't have the type of clothes that you really need to be in the mountains. Like I just wasn't right. prepared for this. And Francois, I kind of we were our, we were kind of leaving each other. Like he was going to go back to France and um, go back to Paris and go get work done. And it, he was leaving me there. And this was going to be on my own kind of jump. So I had no car. I had no way of like, it, I was going to have to hitchhike to get to the top of this mountain. Um, and he wrote down the instructions on how to get to where this exit point is on a, on a napkin at a bar. And he's just like, right now, this is where you go. There's these two. And he said, there's these two jet ski rental stores. Well, jet ski rental in the mountains. <laughs> I'm like, mountains. jet skis. But he was French, so was, he, he meant snowmobiles. <laughs> he sleds? Like he meant snowmobiles. But he, he said jet skis. But I kind of got what he was talking about. Well, it's right. obviously not jet skis. But I, so I kind of like, okay. And he's all, you'll come to a roundabout. And then at the second roundabout, he's all. So he gave me this, like, little thing. And I'm like, okay, cool. And he left. And then the next morning I got up and I started hiking up this road. And I'm, you know, I'm like putting my thumb out, you know, hitchhiking, hoping that someone will stop to pick me up. And no one does, dude. I walk up like half this mountain, like just walking <laughs> up and, I, and I'm freezing to Big, death. I wear this is in France? My, this is in France. It's in Chamonix. Yeah, well, they probably knew you were American, man. <laughs> like, fuck well, I mean, let's put it this way. I wouldn't pick up a hitchhiker either. But in any event, <laughs> then I was just, you know, no one was picking me up. And then all of a sudden, like I was halfway up and all of a sudden this like car pulls over. And there's like these two German dudes in it and they like, you know, oh, come on, get in. And I get in and they're like talking to me, they speak English and they're like, Hey, you know, what are you doing walking out here? It's like really cold out there. And they're like, you're not really dressed for this. I mean, are you okay? And I'm like, no, no, I'm all right. But I was freezing. Like I was, right. my feet were already numb. I couldn't feel my hands. I was like, I didn't have gloves. I mean, I was freezing my balls off and I'm like, this is not a good idea. But I was like, no, I'm just, you know, I'm out here just, you know, going to do some base jumping. And they're just like, what? <laughs> like, 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 what's you that? Jump like, off the cliff? I'm like, oh well, yeah. I didn't want to get into it. I was like, oh, yeah. it's just you know, I'm just out here having some fun, you know, not enjoying the mountains. And they're like, oh, okay, whatever. So they get up to the top of the hill, and we go through one roundabout, and we get to the second roundabout, and they're like, and I'm like, okay, this is where you can drop me off. And they're like, there's no one here. Are you sure you'll be okay? And I'm like, yeah, 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 I'm fine. They're like, where are you? Like, what are you doing out here? I'm like, don't worry about it. It's all good. Thank you. And I get out, and they're like, okay, and they leave me. And I start walking, and I start looking for this like two snowmobile places and I find two snowmobile places right next to each other. And that they had like done, you know, grading of the road, like all this pushing the snow. So all sure. the snow was pushed between these two buildings. So it was like a 20 foot high mound of snow where oh, I yeah. had to go. And I'm just like, ah, 
And I'm like looking to see if I can get around it somehow. And I'm like, I can't see how to get around it. So I just go ahead and climb up this big mountain of snow. And of course, it's going down my shirt. It's getting into my yep. shoes. And I'm just getting like totally covered in snow. I get over the top of it. I roll down the other side and I start walking. And what he had said on his note is that this place has jumped a lot so that there would be like footprints in the snow. Like he's right. all, you'll see a, a trail, but there's no trail. There's no footprints. There's no anything. And I'm just like walking into the woods by myself in clothing that's not designed to be in the Alps. And I'm freezing to death before I even start. Like I'm already freezing. And, he, and I just, I tell myself, okay, I'm going to walk for like 15 minutes. Cause that's how long he said it would take to get there. Right. So I'm going to walk for 15 <clears throat> minutes. And if I don't see anything, I'm turning around. Right. So I'm walking, I'm walking, I'm walking like 15 minutes goes by. And now all of a sudden I realize, oh, I'm too cold. Like, uh oh, I can't go back. Like I have to find the exit point. Like I literally, if I do what I just did, I won't make it. Like I'm, I'm freezing to death right now. Like I, I, there's no way I'm going to make it back. So I'm like, uh oh, this has now become super serious. Like I actually need to find yeah. this exit point. I need to find it like very soon. Luckily, right. my hotel, I chose a hotel right at the bottom of the landing area. So <laughs> in the landing area, there's a hotel right there. So all I have to do is just jump off this cliff and I get to my hotel and I can get in a cold, like a hot shower and heat myself yeah. up because I'm freezing to death. <laughs> And I'm like, uh-oh. And I start walking all of a sudden, maybe 25 minutes, 30 minutes. I don't know the exact time, but there was a, it was longer than it was supposed to. Like I should have turned around a long time ago. I see some footprints and I'm like, oh, oh, oh. Like, and I'm like walking, I'm like following these footprints. I'm pretty sure they're going to take me to the exit point. And sure right. enough, I come around this bend and there's a dude, like this guy in this brightly colored, like, like ski looking suit, like peeing in the snow. And he's basically writing his name and he writes Shane McConkey <laughs> in the snow with his pee stream, which I'm like, wow, that's pretty me? impressive. I mean, how much pee do you have in you, dude? I mean, like you literally wrote your name. I was like, that's really quite impressive. And, and also he turns around, he looks at me, he's all, he's all, hey, dude. And I'm like, dude, I'm like, I'm like, Who are, where are you from? He's like, oh, I'm from Lake Tahoe. And I'm like, what? I'm all, and he, he's like, he tells me, we start talking and stuff. And he tells me how he's a skier and he's there, you know, and I'm, and he, I, it turns out he's going to do a base jump. You know, he's jumping off Maglon 2. And I asked him how many jumps he had. And he had, like, I think at the time, like 20 something. So he's pretty so, new. Oh, he's just yeah. like me. We both had, I mean, I had like third, I think this was my 30th jump. And he had like a right. few less than me. So we were like almost at exactly the same number of jumps at the time. And I really liked him. He was like super funny and super nice. And, and he was just like, hey, yeah, you know, I'm filming the ski movie while we're out here. And we have a camera down there. So do you mind jumping first? And like, they can use you to kind of like, like see where the exit is and how you fall sure. so they can catch me. And I'm like, so they oh, don't yeah, screw dude. up the one shot. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, sure. I'm all, no problem. Not at all. He's like, okay, cool. I'm all, I'm all, I kind of need to get off the mountain right now though. Cause I'm freezing. He's like, yeah, I can tell you're not dressed right. <laughs> like, he's like, what are you doing out here dressed <laughs> yeah, like that? He's like, <laughs> he's like, dude, you're not, I mean, how are you not like frozen to death? Like that you're wearing jeans and like tennis shoes like what the hell's wrong with you and but i'm like yeah whatever i don't need to get into that but <laughs> so I, I gear up as fast as i can i get to the exit point he calls down they respond i jump off and i just run as fast as i could to like the hotel and got in i just literally ran a hot shower and just stood in there for like an hour just like warming up because i was so frozen um but yeah that was that's how i met shane mcconkey and we ended up um, like yeah we ended up becoming friends after that oh uh, yeah i was uh i still remember the the final jump in the Dolomites. That was yeah. so freaking sad. I think my, my kids were even crying when we got the news because we yeah. were such big fans watching it. But you know, he was the nicest like, guy ever. I mean, I, yeah. I, I think Shane McConkey was a very special human being. He, I think if he hadn't gotten into extreme sports, he would have been a comedian. He had some of yeah. the best comedic timing in like the way he would speak and deliver just jokes. And everything was a joke to him. Everything. <laughs> he took nothing seriously. And right. he was one of the funniest person people. I mean, I have never laughed more in my life than spending time with him. Anytime I right. was around him, I was on the ground laughing. And what <laughs> I always found fascinating about him is if anyone else were to say the things he said, you'd punch them in the face. Like he, <laughs> right, but he can get a delivery and timings, everything. Isn't somehow it? he would yeah. say it and you would just laugh and laugh because it's so wrong and unacceptable and not okay, yeah. the things right. he would say. And, but it for some reason, that dude was so... Funny. Probably no malice, just good. No, timing. no, no. Just, he's just he's just funny, yeah. and, and he's a comedian. He was he was a comedian. He didn't do it for work, but he was a comedian, right. and he made me laugh and laugh and laugh. And when he died, it was it was a surprise to me because he he reminded me of Apocalypse Now. Remember that character who he's like, I love the smell of napalm in the morning. Yeah, and, yep. and they're and he's kind of being like they're explaining this guy, and they're like, you know, 
you can just tell this guy has like this like golden light around him. He's never going to get hurt. Like there's some, for some reason, this dude's just going to survive through everything. And that's how I saw Shane. He just had this like golden light around him. And he was just so talented and so good that I'm like, this guy is never going to die. Everyone around him is. Everyone who's anywhere near this dude is going to die for sure. But for some reason, he's going to make it. And when he died, I was just like, wow, I, I couldn't believe it. It was very shocking to me. I was surprised. I was very yeah, surprised. The, the ski base thing. Having to get out of the bindings, man. It's yeah, you know, it, it's it was tricky. And then he had this idea that he wasn't just ski basing; he was ski basing with a wingsuit, which yeah. complicated things even more. And they didn't yeah. really know how high the cliff was. They had overestimated its altitude. He thought that mm -hmm. he would be able to get out of his binding, and he decided not to deploy, and just you know. He, yeah, and if I remember, those were funny bindings that were uh, from a long them. time ago. Yeah, yeah. they were ancient yeah. bindings, and one hooked up, and it was unfortunate. But yeah. That's so, funny. you know, obviously this is probably the story you've talked about and you're probably oh, tired of talking. Yeah. Hold on. Oh, good. Dog's barking. <laughs> Ziggy, stop. Allie, can you take Ziggy upstairs? Ziggy, go on. Upstairs. Go on. Upstairs. <laughs> That's all good, man. Sorry about Mine that. will probably do it too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's someone <laughs> knocking on the door. Anyway. Yes. So obviously, you know, there are so many jumps in this book I'd love to talk about. And the one you're probably tired of talking about, I think it was called the, uh, well, the last tabletop jump oh, in yeah, South, yeah. South Africa. You know, obviously, you know, what I'd love to hear is just, I mean, I read the story on how it happened, but, you know, just so like a quick description of what happened, but I'm actually really curious about the recovery yeah. and how you got yourself back on your feet and yeah. got, refocused and then kind of what comes you know next in life well yeah i mean that covers multiple chapters in my book um <laughs> okay. because it's, it's it's a very big story and it, yeah. and it had a lot of um i learned a lot from that um right. just not about the sport but about life and just what it means to be alive and what, sure. what's important you know um i i had an accident on Table Mountain in South Africa. Uh, we were filming for HBO, Real Sports, mm -hmm. and I had a friend set up a balloon target on a ledge. Okay. And this balloon was on a string that was about eight feet long, and the goal was to hit the balloon right. as target striking. So, like, so practicing you know, um, accuracy and flying. So I... Uh, I mean, it's a super long, complicated story, but I'm going to like yeah. condense it uh, to just a, the simple, like what happened. And when I went to jump, my cameraman who'd set up the balloon told me, he's like, Jeb, the, the, it's a little windy down here. You know, be very careful. He's all, I don't think you should go for the balloon. I think you should fly over it. He's all, I, I think it's too windy. And I said, you know, at the time I was, I was way overconfident. And so this is like a proximity flying in a wingsuit. Oh, super. Yeah. I'm jumping the cliff with a wingsuit and I'm going to be flying within eight feet of the ground, trying to hit this <sighs> balloon doing around 120 miles an hour, I'm oh going over gosh. 120. Um, and I jump off with the wingsuit, start flying towards it. My buddy Jeff is filming me. And as I'm coming in, I see the balloon and you get like what's called object fixation. So you basically target in on your object that you're going to strike, especially when you're doing target striking. And so it's a I race see, car thing too. Yeah. You just it's, focus in and you could become very tunnel vision. And it's like, I'm going to get that target. And what I didn't know is that the wind had blown the balloon to a lower ledge. And by doing so, it created an optical illusion where I couldn't see the ledge I was going to impact. So to hit the balloon, I had to hit the ledge. So I'm coming for the balloon, coming from the balloon. And I end up impacting without even knowing. I mean, I, I think I'm all good. And then I impact and I hit at the waist. So I, I hit flat, solid granite at 122.3 miles an hour, I think is what the GPS said. So um, it's a, in my book, I write a, a, a story about my friend Dwayne who hits a bridge and gets severed in half. And I yeah. end up flying through his body parts and get covered in his blood. And what's interesting is I did the exact same mistake he did. I impacted at the waist, just like he did. Um, when he hit, he got severed in half. Um, when I hit, I bounced. And as I bounced, I started to tumble. 
And when I tumbled, I had to regain control in order to survive because I was over a series of ledges. So had I not regained control, I just would have impacted right away. Um, mm -hmm. Once I did <clears throat> regain control, I had to continue flying. I couldn't just open a parachute because I was too close to the wall. So I had to fly over a series of three ledges with completely um, destroyed legs. My legs were crushed. Um, something fascinating happened as I hit because I knew I hit. Like it wasn't, it was strange. Cause like, I always thought that when Dwayne impacted, he was dead on impact. Like I never thought mm -hmm. there would be any thoughts or anything going through his mind. I thought he hit boom, dead on impact. There's nothing, you know? So when I impacted and I, I was still thinking, I was shocked. Like I was very surprised because I knew I'd gone in. I knew I'd gone in at terminal. I knew I'd hit flat, solid granite. I knew all this instantly. Like it wasn't like, and I knew what the consequences were. You cannot right. have that accident and survive. It's an unsurvivable accident. You're going to die, uh, um, yeah. period. And I'd seen my best friend or a good, a good friend die like that. So mm. my mind instantly shattered into two separate, like mind, my mind went into two separate places. One part of my brain was doing kind of the math. It was doing like what I needed to do to survive. It was like, okay, you need to recover from this tumble. Okay, there's a ledge, you need to fly over it. There's a second ledge, you need to go over that. It was doing all the calculations of what I needed to do to open a parachute and live. Um, the other part of my mind was having more of a philosophical kind of conversation. Now, this is all happening in seconds, but right. my brain stretched everything. It, it's called time distortion. And whenever you're in a, a really traumatic experience, um, it's not always, but sometimes your mind will actually stretch time or give you the perception that it's stretching time. It's incredible, and isn't it? It's, it's unbelievable. Actually, it, this felt like minutes for me. It, it felt like an, a quite a long period. Um, and I actually have a conversation where it's like, okay, you've just impacted a terminal velocity. You're, you're <clears> going to die. This is unsurvivable. Um, you've got two options, you know, you can, uh, go ahead and pull, you know, and, you know, bleed out while you're waiting for rescue. You might get mm -hmm. five minutes. You might get 10 minutes, 20 minutes max. I I've been part of so many helicopter rescues at this point. I know how long they take. Um, yeah. I'm like, I'll be in a hospital if I'm lucky in about 45 minutes to an hour. Um, if I'm lucky, there's no way I can survive that long. Like I, yeah. I'm, I'm too, the, the damage is too extreme. Um, and the pain is too acute. Like I knew my legs were gone. Like they were just right. crushed into nothingness. So I, I'm like, you <clears throat> are going to die. So you can choose. Do you want to die a slow, painful, agonizing death? Or do you want to just not pull it all, go in head first and just turn it off instantly? Do you want to die fast? And it was a, a, a very strange position to be in. You know, it's kind of like having someone with a gun pointed at you. And it's like, hey, I shoot you in the head or I'll shoot you in the gut. You choose. Right. What do you want? You know, and and I it's it's interesting because I went from being a suicidal person, right? Someone who didn't want to be here anymore, who was ready to end my life um, to all of a sudden being put in this situation where I could have ended it. And I decided, you know what? The only thing that matters is time. That's it. Nothing else means anything. At that exact moment, my entire life boiled down to what really mattered. And what really mattered were the seconds I get to exist. And I was like, if I can get 10 more seconds, I want them. If I can get 10 more minutes, I want them. Whatever it is, I want it. I don't care if I'm in pain. I don't care if I'm suffering. I don't care what those moments are. I want those moments. And right. at that exact instant, the part of my brain that was doing the calculations basically is like, okay, you pull now. Now's the time right now, or you die. And I remember consciously going, well, it's a good thing. You don't mind pain. Let's see yeah, how much time I've been there in. before. <laughs> and I just pitched and I remember pitching my parachute open with line twists at a one and a half second canopy ride. As I hit a second time, crushing both my legs again. Um, and then I'm laying in the sun, direct sunlight, and it was South Africa, record-breaking temperatures, like 120 degrees outside. And I'm basically being cooked and I'm shattered. Like it, pain doesn't describe it. Like it, it begun, it's beyond pain in any normal sense of what that word means. 
it, it it's so overwhelming and so extreme that it's all there is there. Nothing else exists for you, but pain. And I was suffering so bad that, you know, for a second, I'm like, oof, I made the wrong choice. <laughs> that, was a, <laughs> I, I, that was, that was a mistake. Like, okay. I, 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 was, I made a mistake, oh. but quickly that thought kind of left my head. And all of a sudden I went into kind of a, uh, I don't know if you want to call it a trance or what it was, but a shock. Just, no, I, I never went into shock. We always hear that. Yeah, I don't know what it is. I, I didn't. I didn't yeah. feel. I, I felt the pain. The pain didn't go away. It was still there. It was as strong as ever. It actually got worse. It started throbbing. It created this like throbbing, like you felt like nerve molten, damage and yeah, everything. Yeah, it felt like molten lava was rolling through my legs. I mean, it was just. I felt like I was on fire. I felt like I was burning alive. Um, and. So a couple tourists like came up on the trail and they showed up first and this woman was talking to me and she was like asking me my name and trying to keep me like from going to sleep. Sure. Um, but I just, I remember I answered a few of her questions and then eventually I'm just like, I'm done answering questions. And I just kind of stopped talking and I stopped moving and I stopped anything, but I was still awake, but I didn't, you wouldn't know I was awake. Yeah. I, right. I seemed like I wasn't. Um, I don't know how long the rescue took, but it took a long time. Um, I, I, a chopper showed up, they lowered a basket. They had to stabilize me, put me in some, some, some kind of sled thing. Just getting into it. Completely wrapped is... me up. Then they put me on the sled and sent me to altitude. Um, the, it's funny. Cause like partially through it, as they were moving, I was screaming in pain and, uh, they were like, okay, we're going to give you morphine. I'm like, no morphine. I don't hmm. no drugs. I want no drugs. And they're just like, uh, and I, and at that time, I thought they didn't give them to me. I was sure that I, cause I said no. And you know, when you say no, they're not supposed to, I found right. out only two years later after watching a documentary about it, that they actually did give it to me against my will. Like against did my, they? they did, which did upsets it? me. I'm yeah. actually upset about it because yeah. that means my memories of the experience are tainted. Right. I, I, sure. I feel yeah. like I earned that experience. Yeah. I deserved that pain. I deserved that punishment for the mistakes that I made. I wanted to have that experience. I wanted to feel that pain. I deserved that pain. Um, and they took it from me. And it's upsetting to know that, you know, I was saying no. And the yeah. only reason they gave it to me is because they didn't want to hear me scream. You know, yeah. if I'm, if I'm willing to yeah. take the pain, you should be able to, you should be willing to hear me fucking in pain. I mean, yeah. I get it. I'm screaming. So what move me, you know, yeah. put something in my mouth. Let me bite on it. Just, I, I am in pain. I'm supposed to be in pain. It was, I, I, I was, it took me two years to realize that, that all my memories from being in the helicopter to the ambulance. So you don't really be, remember that. Can't be trusted. Yeah. I, I remember, but I can't trust them, you know, cause I don't know. Cause I thought I was dying. You know, I felt like I was like slipping into another place, but now sure. I, was, I was, I was high. How do I know? You know what I mean? Yeah. So well, if you've never, you, you know, <laughs> but I, you, you'd never use painkillers. That was never, probably. I don't use them, but, but. Anyways, I'm in, yeah. I'm in the, in the ambulance and I'm not responsive. Like they're trying to talk right. to me, but I'm not responding, but I'm awake. I'm a, I'm a conscious, but I'm not, I'm just mm -hmm. not responding to anybody. And I hear them say, they're like, oh, this is an obvious double amputation. Like I heard them say that, like, they're like, we're going to have to take his legs. And I remembered when they said that all of a sudden I became so happy. It was really strange because up until that moment, I was a hundred percent certain I was going to die. There was right. zero percent chance this, this was an unsurvivable accident. And when I heard them say, we're going to have to take his legs. I was like, what that means I might not die. I'm like, wait, wait, I, I couldn't believe it. Like, I'm like, there's a chance I'm not going to die. I, 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 I was like, oh. I was so happy. Like all of a sudden I got, I didn't move. I didn't show any expression, nothing, but internally I'm like, oh my God, I might not die. And then this like overwhelming joy came through my body. Even though I was going to lose my legs, I didn't give a shit. I was like, oh my God, there's a chance I could survive. And then they take me to the hospital. They, I, I remember MRIs, uh, like x-rays, like all this sure. stuff. And then I'm put in this dark room kind of by myself and I'm just in there. And again, I'm not, nobody knows I'm awake. I am, but they don't know <laughs> that, right. that I'm awake. And I hear, um, I hear these doctors in the next room talking and one of them's like, man, I can't believe he doesn't have any broken bones. And I, I'm like, 
I'm like, they can't be talking about me. Like, there's no way they're talking about me. He's like, and he's like, I can't believe it. We gotta, we gotta do some more tests. And all of a sudden he like walks in and turns the lights on. And I kind of like, you know, I open my eyes and he's, he starts looking at me. He's like, you're awake. And I'm like, yeah, I'm awake. And I'm, he's like, okay, I got some stuff to tell you. He's all, I, I, I've got some good news. He's like, um, he's like, uh, we can't find any real broken bones. He's like, there's, you have a broken fibula, but it's a hairline fracture. He's like, honestly, if that's all it was, you'd be walking out of here today. He's like, um, we think you've blown your AC on your left knee. We won't know until we go in because we're going to sure. have to do some like exploratory surgery, basically, because yeah. my, 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 I'm my, sure your muscles were just crushed. The, the, yeah. the muscles in my thighs were smashed, like completely crushed. Um, he's like, you have crushed your quadriceps. I think your quadriceps yeah. are smashed. They're crushed. Um, what's happening right now is your kidneys are shutting down because your body is trying oh, to process all the trauma. Well, it's trying to process the proteins from my, yep. my crushed muscle through my kidneys and he's all your kidneys are shutting down. So that's, that's the most pressing issue we have. He's all, you have a massive gaping hole in your right shin. That's going to need, um, skin grafting. We're gonna have to use skin grafting to close that up. He's all, <clears> but aside from that, he's like, honestly, he's all, you're going to be fine. He's all, you're going to have a 100% recovery and you're going to be able to walk and run and do everything you were able to do before. And I was like, and I was like, what? Like, I couldn't believe it. Like it was, it was unbelievable. I, it, I could not, it was so powerful. And I was so happy that I could make such a horrible mistake, a mistake that other of my friends have made and it ended them and, and, and get a second chance at life, you know? And it was funny because uh, uh, then a woman walked in and she's like, hi, Jeb. She's like, I know this is a really bad time. She's like, but um, I need you to give me a statement for the press. And I'm like, I'm like, what? I'm like, what are you talking about? Now, now you know you're not going to die. It's I'm like, a statement for the press. I'm like, well, I'm like, what are you talking about? And she's like, she's all, Holy Jeb, shit. Um, there were people on the mountain who filmed your accident live. Um, it's all over the news now. There are over 200 members from the press outside the hospital trying to get in they're pretending to be your mom your dad your family they're trying to get in here um i just need something i need you to say something that i can give them so that they will like leave us alone pretty much and i'm like um, are you serious she's like so like, yes just just what what do you want to say to them and i'm like tell them this is the greatest day of my life and she's just like what like how is this the greatest day of your life i'm like i just made the worst mistake any human being could ever make and I'm getting a second chance to live. I don't, if that's not the greatest day of your life, then I don't know what is, you know, mm. I, 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 and I ended up getting put in a room and there was a lot of surgeries. I went through four or five different surgeries and I sure. needed skin grafting multiple times. And I need to use things called vacuum dressings, which people who, you know, in your line of work understand because you get these, maybe not mine. <laughs> well, <laughs> the, people, the military who do, brothers people who do those. military stuff, right. <laughs> yeah. They, they yeah. understand what a, what a vacuum dressing is because you get such bad wounds that they actually have to like suck flesh over bone in order to like oh. put skin on it. So I was on a skin like the, and I, they would open up my leg and I could see the bone and I could like move my toes. You could see stuff moving around inside, like as they're like for two weeks, as they're trying to like get flesh over the bones so they can skin graft on top of it. Oh so gosh. every day I just watched them as they did it. It's actually fascinating. Um, but during that process, something happened to me because I was, uh, it was eyes on isolation, basically. I, for six weeks, I was in a room by myself staring at a ceiling um, with nothing but my own thoughts. And it was a fascinating experience because up until that moment, I'd lived my life as if I was going to die like right. the next day. Like I had never expected to survive as long as I did. And I was 35 when this happened, you know, and I never expected to make it to 30, but I had never thought about it. Right. So now here I am 35. I had an absolute like fatal accident and survived. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I started thinking about, what does it mean if I don't die? Like what happens if I live to be 40 or 45 or God forbid 50? <gasps> like I, I, all of a sudden this, this, this like almost terror, but something I'd never thought about in my entire life was this idea of like, what happens if you don't die? I was so accepting of death and so accepting of my own mortality and so prepared for it to end at any second that I had never thought about what it meant to survive. So up to that point, 
I, I was making lots of money doing what I did, but I never saved any of it. I would make money and I'd spend it. Like I, I had no savings. I didn't own a house. I didn't own a car. I didn't own anything. I just got money and jumped with it. That's it. My whole life was just this process of just churning money into jumps and experiences. That's all I cared about. Sure. It's all that mattered. And all of a sudden I'm sitting there going, this is unsustainable. Like I, I, I can't survive like this. I will die. Like it right. will happen. And I really do love my life. I love being here. I love experiencing with time and with life. There's endless possibilities. Anything can happen. The second you die, all possibilities end. That's what death is. It's over. Mm -hmm. There's nothing. So all of a sudden my brain just was like, oh my God, I, I have to change everything. I have to change everything that I'm doing. This is un acceptable. I can't do this anymore. I must change. And it, it shifted. I, I, I actually say this. I grew up that day. Like I was a child. I was a 35 year old baby the day before. Like I was this little kid running around doing little kid stuff. I was Peter Pan, dude. I was right. Peter Pan. Just kind of like, I was a child. I had a child way of thinking, a child way of looking at stuff. And I had no regrets. Zero. I, I lived the life I wanted to live and I had yeah. zero regrets. But I started projecting into the future. And at 50, you know, I could only, how much longer could I earn a living like this? Sure. I mean, what, what skills do I have? I mean, what, base jumping doesn't really translate into like many other aspects of life, right? right? So right, I've spent right. all this time developing this skill <laughs> that when I'm no longer physically capable of doing it anymore, how am I going to earn a living, right? right? And if I'm like, oh my God, I'm 50 years old or 60 years old, yeah. and I've literally pissed away all of my wealth, all of my life, all of my everything. And now I'm working at Kmart just to like live in a cardboard box. Right. I mean, that's, I will have regrets. Like then I yeah. will be grateful, right? So I'm like, I, I do not want that to happen to me. So all of a sudden after that, I started investing my money. I bought a house. <laughs> I started like right. realizing, you know, I'm saving. I'm no longer going to be wasteful. I'm no longer going to just throw my money in the trash. I, I, it shifted my entire perspective on life because right. all of a sudden I saw something I had never seen before, which was a future, you know? And I, it was weird because yes, I was happy. Yes. I wasn't suicidal. A lot of people confuse accepting death's inevitability with being suicidal. They're not the same thing. Right. right. And they, I didn't want to die. I wanted to live, but I just wasn't thinking about the future at all. You know, I was just thinking about, I literally, it's very rare that you meet somebody who lives in the moment always, o always, yeah. always a hundred percent of the time for decades. Like, because, because it's unsurvivable. You can't survive like that. And the only reason why I'm alive is because I am lucky, lucky, yeah. lucky, 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 so lucky. So I realized that it wasn't skill that kept me alive. Skill helped me a little bit, but that's not what it was. It was luck. I got super lucky and luck will run out. Yeah. So all of a sudden I'm like, okay, I need to shift. I need to change. I need to become something different. And that accident, it, it saved my life in, in, in so many ways. And it gave me a future in a way that I could never have had without it. I, mm. I actually had to have that experience. I had to have that, that you have to be burned to the ground and completely destroyed before you can rebuild yourself into something else. You know, and I had to be destroyed. I had to destroy myself to grow into what I became. And they always say like, you know, the hardest metal is hammered the hardest. Right. And, right. and that's the thing, dude, I was molten metal and I was just hammering myself over and over again until I finally beat myself into the shape I wanted to be in. And I think that that's what a lot of people don't realize. You're in a process of creating yourself. You're right. building yourself. There are no failures. You're not failing at anything. You're in the process of making you, you, right? And that's, that's what, and I, I, there's a saying I loved it. It was at the end of the Amy Winehouse documentary and Tony Bennett says it, and it was beautiful. And it's like, the longer you live, life teaches you how to live it, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's the thing. If you can live long enough, life will teach you how to live life. And I feel like I'm finally in this place where I'm living my life in a way that I am just so happy and so content. And I wake up every morning now, just, I mean, if I can go to the bathroom by myself without help, without having to ring a little bell, I'm like, yeah. this is a beautiful day, right? I, I, I 
the perspective has shifted 180 degrees in my life from this dark, depressed person who doesn't even want to wake up in the morning to this person who loves and appreciates every moment they get. And it's an incredible journey that I was able to go on. And yeah. that's what my book became about. And it was fascinating because as I wrote the book, I started learning this about myself. I started understanding this about myself. And now after writing this book, I say that everyone, everyone, even if nobody else will ever read it, you should write your life down. You should do it because what you'll get from it personally, from the experience of writing about your life, honestly, like don't make shit up. Be real right. about what happened to you and who you were and what it was, right? right? And if you do right. that, it will help you get insight into who you are. It's, yeah. it's absolutely a powerful process. And, and it gives you a form of immortality. People will be able to read this for thousands of years. Your minds, your mind, your memories, your thoughts will continue after you die. And I think there's something absolutely fascinating about this whole process. And, and get this, you may say, oh, my life isn't that interesting. Nobody wants to read this. Your kids want to read this. Their kids want to read this. Your friends want to read this. Your parents want to read this. People who care about you want to read this. People want to know what you think. People care what you think. Your life matters. You mean something to somebody. And I'm telling you, you got to write it. It's, it's, I, I am, I, I've done a lot in my life, right? I, it took yes. me three and a half years to write this book. I'd never written anything longer than an email before I wrote this book, you know? And the book turned into 220,000 words that I had to edit down to 180,000 words. The average autobiography is about 80,000 words. Like, is it real? Oh, yes, long autobiographies are about 100,000. When I was going to publishers, none of them said they would, they're like, we're not publishing anything over 100,000 words, period. Like, we're not going to do it. And my book was 200,000 words at that. It was two autobiographies at that point. So I'm just like, every, I had to find a publisher who would allow me to tell my story. That Because 100,000 words wasn't enough. I couldn't do it. I'm like, there's no way. The story's too big, you know? So I had to find someone. And luckily I did. I found, you know, D'Angelo Publications allowed me to write the book I wanted to write how I wanted to write it. And that's why I'm so blown away that you read it in one night. Because yeah. it, it's such a mat. You read two autobiographies in one evening, which says you're a fast reader, dude. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this intelligence guys have to read fast a lot. So, uh, you know, the Jeb, absolutely one of the most fascinating humans I've ever oh. met in my life. And oh. one of the best stories of resilience and staying well, power. Well, thank and, you. Uh, I appreciate that. I absolutely honored you're willing to, uh, to join us on this uh, podcast. And for those that uh, don't remember, it's called Memoirs from the Edge. Definitely <laughs> get this book. It is super dope and an absolute page turner. <laughs> well, so thank Jeff, you. I appreciate it. I, I, thank you so much I'm for happy you on. brought me on. I'm very fun talking to you, dude. And yeah. thank you. I appreciate it. It's been beautiful. Likewise. All right, Chuck. Dude, that was